Um, okay, it's been a four, so we're going to jump right in. And we're going to start with Tammy, who is going to talk to us a little bit about Moran, because we have a really awesome Moran exhibit coming this summer um, that we're excited about, so we want to start kind of talking a little bit more about Moran. So. Yeah, she has a meeting at 10.30, so she won't have a ton of time for us today. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> meeting to meeting. Um, so um, we are going to have a, a Moran exhibit called, uh, that is in conjunction with the uh, 150th anniversary of Yellowstone National Park. And that's where the idea came from this. And we were fortunate, fortunate enough, enough to get the watercolor sketches that Moran, so his first visions of Yellowstone National Park, which are really cool. And they're up at the Yellowstone Heritage Center in uh, Gardner, Montana. And uh, I can tell you they are beautiful, but maybe understated compared to some of his giant paintings that we couldn't get uh, because uh, COVID and a lot of people are doing remodeling and uh, uh, the Smithsonian's redoing all their galleries. They can't loan any. The Gilcrease is closed and doing a new building. So we've got a couple of theirs. But um, so um, we're putting this together with some different ideas. Uh, those sketches along with uh, William Henry Jackson's photography, as um, all of you might know, um, are what made this um, beautiful image called the Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone that Thomas Moran took to Congress in 1872 when he painted it and said this needs to be a national park and I'm going to call myself Thomas Yellowstone Moran, in fact, um, uh, after this, because I feel so strongly about it. So he, this was really impactful on Thomas Moran's career. Um, this is at the Interior Museum of the Department of Interior in Washington, D.C. And I was so fortunate that <laughs> Tracy uh, Benez said, I'll let you in. We're closed right now, but she took me in, and they have an exhibit now called The Big Picture. So what I hope to do is do a little co-advertising from Wyoming to Washington and have our exhibit connected with these paintings that they couldn't loan us. In fact, the registrar laughed at me when I asked them <laughs> if they could loan us this image. <laughs> and uh, Tracy apologized from the registrar to me several times when I was there. Um, and I said, oh, I get it. I, get, I understand. They've just gotten it back. This painting had been out um, at the Smithsonian. It had been around the country. Uh, it had been out for so long, but in, in 1872, 1872, Congress did pay $10,000 for this painting, and did I move, or whoops, did I go too far? And this painting in, in 1873, and uh, this is the chasm of the Colorado, which is the Grand Canyon. They built that room around the painting. <laughs> <laughs> it looks yeah. like it. Wow. Yeah. You will also notice on these two paintings, whoops, um, this, the, the touch pad is sensitive here, mm -hmm. um, that, what? There you go. Okay, so this one and this one don't have that gold framing around them, the, mm -hmm. the Thomas Moran, Al, Albert Bierstadt, those painters had, they took off those frames mm -hmm. so they could fit in the space. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the space of the museum is only 2,000 square feet, so that's about, well, that's about the size of the exhibit we're going to have. We're going to have it in the, um, just in the um, Changing Visions Gallery in the back. Not the bison. The bison is going to have part of the women's exhibit for our 35th anniversary. But um, what I thought was really 
interesting that I didn't know about Thomas Moran. So these two paintings were bought for $10,000. They were meant to be displayed as they are right now across from each other. Uh, it's so cool that they're in, in the Department of the Interior, but nobody really goes down to the Department of Interior when they're in D.C. because it's kind of out of the way, and you have to go through a bit more rigorous security check. Not huge. They make you sign a paper, and, you know, the airplane scan you in. But um, it, it'll be great for us to kind of have that connection with um, them to give them some advertising and for us to get some advertising from them. So is one at one side of the room, the other at the other end of the room? Yes. Oh, good. Yep. Okay. So, um, and um, this opened actually right after COVID started in the summer of 2020. My husband and I were the 129th and the 130th people to visit the exhibit. Because, and it had mostly been um, politicians, dignitaries, that and their families that had seen it. So, um, if you're in Washington, they're hoping to open up soon, definitely by this summer. And I'm working with Tracy to try to do some connection, but I wanted to show you a couple things about Moran. So, in the painting, The Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone, um, uh, this is a lot about what I was thinking about, too, but in Thomas Moran's paintings, who's in the painting? He typically doesn't do people, and we don't think, or I didn't think, he did much wildlife, either. That's why we have some beer stats. Our first Moran, Eternal Snows of the Teton, or, or the Grand Tetons, that uh, Lynn Fries gifted us recently, that's in the front of the Pathways Gallery, hanging in there now. Um, landscape. He was a landscape artist, right? But he did put some people in there. And I think this is significant. This, uh, they assumed that the person on the left, with the hat and the bag, is Hayden. Oh, wow. Because it was Hayden's expedition. Nobody seems to know who the native person is, <laughs> or why Thomas Moran put this native person in here. If we go out in our gallery and look in the Gilcrease, I was looking close at those little tiny people that are in there. That's a native person definitely standing in the front. You can see that there's a red part of the head. So I blew this up a little bit. In Thomas Rand's diary, um, and there's lots of scholars that are talking about this, he wore a red flannel shirt. So Thomas Moran is in that group. I'm guessing it's Jackson and Hayden with him too. Hayden did not like Native people. They were scared of them. But Thomas Moran and um, Jackson, the photographer, went to the Crow Agency, met with the Crow people, and I'm also finding in their diary they keep referring to the Indian. The Indian went out and killed three deer out of the five we got. The Indian did this. So there was some native person helping them with their with this expedition. So this um, and if you do, if you don't know that this all of these sketches came from the Hayden expedition, which began in um, 18. Uh, 71, um, and that's when he collected this information and when Jackson was doing his photography. Thomas Moran was not asked to join the expedition initially. Beerstadt was asked before Moran was. Laurie's shaking, yes, because I like Beerstadt. <laughs> he turned it down, and there was another um, artist who had worked with uh, Hayden before. Um, the expedition, and actually Moran joined the expedition of, uh, he came in from the Montana way, but he joined them up after they'd been out in the field already for um, a month. So I think it's pretty interesting that he's got these people, and especially this mysterious native person. Also a big deal is, when we think about the 
image we have out there from the Gilcrease of the terraces at Mammoth, which a lot of us have been there. Hayden and his group found a bunch of people there, <laughs> uh, what they refer to as semi-invalids, room, room, rheumatoid, room, rheumatic, arthritis, sufferers that were using the pools already. So maybe this wasn't such a mystery. There's a lot of things that led up to this whole expedition, right? And I'll talk about that in the um, exhibit. But the big thing that prompted the Hayden expedition was there was another expedition in 1870. Some people from Montana went in to check out, does anybody know what Yellowstone was nicknamed before it was Yellowstone? Coulter's Hell. <laughs> Coulter's? Coulter's Hell, yep. Because Coulter, what was his first name again? John. John, John Coulter. John. John Coulter, who was known to be a storyteller, a teller of tall tales. Um, he had gone into the region, he had broke away from his party, and he was telling everybody that there's these... Uh, geographic thermal features in this place and they steam out of the ground and they're like you are crazy <laughs> um, but he insisted um, he was um, chased by some native people stripped naked apparently and chased by some Ooh. native people but he got away and this he comes back with these stories about this place and it's like no it's really beautiful but there are these steam coming out of the ground, and they, nobody believed him. So this 1870 expedition was kind of prompted from Coulter's Hell. They thought he was telling stories, and that's where it got the nickname Coulter's Hell. Uh, interestingly oh, enough, hell. yep, hell like hell with the devil. Yep. So a lot of features in Yellowstone, um, and they might have, some of them have retained their. Um, sort of hellish names, but a lot, you know, devils, and they had different references to hell. Probably because of the sulfur smell, the steam, and all that kind of crazy information, but I thought that was interesting, and people have actually written about that, um, that those things are um, in Yellowstone. But getting back to Thomas Moran and Wildlife, Lori, Bay, I was surprised as you are, but we know that Bierstadt did quite a bit of wildlife in his paintings, but he also um, made a lot of um, maybe not so true images to the, to the landscape, right? And he would kind of like maybe, oh, this wasn't inhabited. Like I said, um, Hayden his party found a bunch of people hanging out by Mammoth anyway. Um, so it wasn't maybe that mysterious. So in the Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone, there is, of course, some kind of raptor bird up there. Oh, oh wow. I see that. Hard to see yeah. in, in the picture, but um, uh, it, uh, Tracy thought it was an osprey because that would be osprey by the waterfall, and I said, maybe, but osprey are usually lighter colored underneath, <coughs> that's how I always can recognize them, but it's from a distance. One wildlife. Ooh. Oh. Can you see the wildlife here? <laughs> this is more of a close-up, right? Yeah. A felled elk oh. or deer. I think it's a deer because they talked a lot about um, hunting deer for the party. So a mule deer, probably. Smaller. Yep. And that one, when you're looking at the big painting, blends right into the... It just looks like a log. Right, a right. Yeah, it blends yeah. into the geography of the rocks. Mm -hmm. And that's what, that's what Moran really was concentrating on, too. He was concentrating on the geography. The, the painting itself is 
a conglomeration of different features, but he was doing sort of a scientific look at the, the um, flora, the trees, the geography, right? But he did sneak in this, and then, what's back there? Um, oh. Oh, oh, little black bear. Oh. Tracy had to point this one out to me. Oh, I, I, didn't to see. I didn't see it right away, but you got to look in the shadows. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> wow. That's awesome. That's Lori great. is not impressed. It's like a jelly stick. It's not quite the same, but still, um, kind of. Uh, um, I was thinking it. Another artist, and I can't think of the name of it right now, but um, yeah. looks similar. Wow, yeah, you would not see that. So this picture, um, which is out of focus a little bit, but at the Museum of the Interior, they had Tracy had made this um, printed plastic piece. So if your vision impaired. You can touch this oh. and feel the painting. And she said, I left it white because if you're, if you're, you can't see it, you're not going to be able to see the colors anyway. And it really stands out that this is what you can use it for. So I, I thought that was a really good idea. Um, and then we look back and see that um, the Morans we have here on loan, this one is on loan, the three Tetons, no wildlife. <laughs> cattle, oh. cattle in the background, and over in this corner over here, there's a bunch of musicians, and some of you might have noticed this, but you'll go back and look. Wow. In tuxedos playing music. <laughs> there probably is, but all this is cattle and horses. I've looked um, as closely as I can see, but yeah, and I've looked in the shadows too, and it might be that this is just, you know, it's built up and stuff on there that made it darker. So there might be something back there, but it's. I think that the musicians themselves are pretty interesting. Yeah. But on the Idaho side, right? Thomas Moran never made it to Jackson. Um, they, um, the, the expedition came back like the year after, so in 19, 1872, and that's when they named um, Moran the mountain after him. Uh, and so we have the eternal snows. This is our first ever acquired Moran in our collection. <laughs> Thanks to Lynn Freeze. Also done in 1912. So when you're looking at these um, images, well, and I'll talk, I'll talk to you a little bit about a couple other things that were in the Department of Interior. But, um, when we, when we have the exhibit up and we're talking about Moran, that his sketches are so significant because these are his, from his hand, that's why I get so excited about this, but it's from his hand, his very first visions of Yellowstone. And he, when he did that, um, a little bit ahead, image of, you know, the, the Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone. Trying to get back to that. <laughs> Let me go out of the slideshow. Um, that painting, he used those sketches, you know, he did this back east in his studio. But this painting is parts of those sketches and parts of William Henry Jackson's photographs, mm -hmm. which we will, I will blow up a few of those and have those printed to put in the exhibition. Um, Jackson never thought he was, he was just supplementary. He thought 
he never considered himself as a very um, important part of the expedition. Um, but this is what made the first national park. So there's a lot of significance to those sketches. Um, and then, I just wanted to say, if you are, and I know some of you live in D.C. sometimes, <laughs> so if you do have the opportunity when it's uh, completely open, you can take tours of the Department of Interior. And not only seeing the museum, but Tracy took me around, and um, I was, with my uh, interest in Native arts, I was thrilled to see this. Woody Crumbo is a very famous uh, Native American painter um, from Oklahoma. He did a lot of uh, murals in Oklahoma, too. Um, also, in the same room are Valina Herrera, Alan Hauser, who some of you have heard, and Gerald Naylor, all really significant early artists from uh, the, the part of the 20th century. They all painted in there in 1939. The funny one was, this is a depiction of Audubon, and I thought that was crazy because he liked to kill the birds and draw them oh. as much as I know. So. <laughs> Him sitting in this placid scene, um, this was an entire hallway wall mural that had a bunch of different, that it had uh, Davy Crockett and uh, all these different people in it that was done by this artist for, but I thought the Audubon was the, <laughs> the craziest one. But, um, that is, I think, about all I have to tell you about Moran right now. And if you have any questions, i got some time to take any. Lori. The painting that we have, that we own. Yep. Do we have any idea where he was standing when he did those sketches? Because he yeah. wasn't always exact. Right. Mm -hmm. And like I said with the Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone, that was put together from uh, all kinds of different things. And what he, um, here, let me go back to that one. Um, what he concentrated on with that one was getting the details of the geography, the rock, and the trees. So in the one that we have, which is here, the eternal snows of Mount Moran. He was definitely, of course, on the Teton side when he was getting this, his knowledge, when he was building his knowledge of the geography and the, the flora and fauna of the area. I don't know that this was an exact spot where he was standing. Obviously, it's up pretty high because if there's a glacier, and it, it would be super interesting if somebody who climbs rocks, which would not be me, <laughs> to go up there and try to find where this location is, right? Or a similar location. I'm guessing it'd be kind of hard because he probably put pieces of it together. But obviously, now Thomas Moran, another thing about him, when he went on the Hayden expedition, he was like 110 pounds. Oh my gosh. I think he was five foot three or something like that. Little guy, slight, never ridden a horse, so he had to have a pillow. He never <laughs> shot a gun, and I never think he shot a gun, but we, can, we get the pistol they gave him. We're going to have that in the exhibition. It's in pristine condition. Never shot a gun and had never, well, he said he never had slept under the stars, and I was talking to Adam about this, and I said, well, he was up around Lake Superior. He had to be camping before this, right? But um, maybe he meant that he had never, like, slept outside of a tent, or, but he slept out in the open for the first time when he got to Yellowstone. 
he was really taken with Yellowstone. And you can see that um, it promoted his um, exploring and, and depicting different places. As far as the Grand Canyon, I believe Thomas Moran, and I know this is true, he was the first artist that ever saw the Grand Canyon, not, not of the Yellowstone, the, the one in, mostly in Arizona, saw the Grand Canyon from the Colorado, so the base of the canyon instead of from above. Uh -huh. um, and his paintings are really symbolic, and there's a lot to that if you look at the, the, um, the Grand Canyon one here. So this uh, chasm of the Colorado, um, there's a, it's not really clear on my picture there, but there's a rainbow in that um, thunderstorm. He saw this thunderstorm come up. Um, I doubt the rainbow was in it at that time, but you know, when you think about Bierstadt's sublime, and this where there's beauty and danger all in the same place. And, um, oh, and I didn't mention, I don't remember if it was, I put that. In the Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone, right about here, I think it was, there's a snake. Oh. <laughs> so kind of a very Medivedan, yeah. maybe a symbol of the serpent in the garden of this really beautiful um, place. But it was this trip, first trip west, the Hayden Expedition, that it's all really significant to him and why he wanted to paint this area. And we know he did a lot of paintings of the Tetons from the other side. Um, but um, his uh, signature, and I, I meant to put those in, but I forgot. So when he signed this painting, he signed it Thomas Moran, because this was before he became Thomas Yellowstone Moran. And then he made his own brand. So if you go out and look at those paintings um, that we have in the um, exhibited right now, you'll see there's an M, and the Y is the middle of the M, Yellowstone. And there's like a, it drops down with a tail with like a, um, what, you know, like a pitchfork. Yeah. <laughs> you know, what, what is that called? So this looks like a brand, and, it, oh, and the T is part of the Y. So uh -huh. he gets the Thomas Yellowstone Moran, all in that M. And it looks like a, like a brand. Or a funky monogram. Yeah, it looks sort of, um, ooh, devil's. Poulter's hell. <laughs> but, um, yeah. You better run away. Is it 1030? Yeah. yeah. Well, it's been fun telling you about Moran. I have lots, lots of information about We'll be doing more trainings, obviously, with Moran before the exhibit comes up, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, because I have a lot of ideas about that. So, um, I think it'll be a lot of fun. And even though we couldn't get that big one in there, <laughs> right. Right. That's yeah. Cool. Yeah. Tammy, his studio was in New York. Is that right? Did you? Uh, I think so. Yes. Yeah. So that's where he did the painting of the the big one. He did the big one. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So. Thank you. Cool. That was that was great. Um, so now I'll turn it over to Michelle, who's got a little update from programs and events department. Nice. Good morning, everyone. I'm going to come up here so nobody has to crane their neck and stare out the window. Oh, and Stephanie too. Hi, Stephanie. So I think we've met uh, a lot of people in this room, um, but I'd like to introduce my colleague, Stephanie Michio. Um, and my name is Michelle Gibson, for people who I have not met. Um, so I'm really excited because it just at the beginning of January finished my first year here at the museum. And now it's cross-country ski season again. So I see a couple of familiar faces that I met skiing last winter, and I'm looking forward to, to joining you on those expeditions. Um, I just thought I would take a couple minutes to 
um, give you a little lowdown over the programs and events team and, and a, a little refresher on what it is that Stephanie and I take care of for the museum. Um, so I'll go chronologically. Uh, through the winter months, we oversee the first Sundays. And um, I think everybody in the room is familiar with what the first Sunday programming is. Uh, but for some folks that might be new, this is our opportunity to offer uh, complimentary admission to area locals, as well as some special programming. Um, we've had to uh, shift in the way that we deliver special programming, thanks to our friend COVID. Um, but we have been diligently standing outside, serving treats in below zero weather with uh, hot chocolate and hot cider. Uh, there are some people in the room who have actually joined us for this bill. We always are appreciative of you coming to help us out. Um, we have been doing take-home family-friendly craft bags instead of having um, craft tables set up for people to do. So again, just trying to figure out how we can bring this special programming. Um, we've been partnering with some nonprofit organizations that have like-minded missions. Um, and so we've been doing some co-work with the Wyoming Wildlife Advocates. Uh, we worked with Jackson Hole High School when they did the opening of the um, exhibit, uh, the infectious nature of wildlife. Infectious culture, culture of, wildlife. Of, of wildlife, yeah. Um, as well as with the Teton Raptor Center over the past couple of months. So um, I do realize that, you know, clearly being out in the public um, is not always great for everybody in this day and age, but of course we welcome you to come and join us on our next two first Sundays, uh, February 6th and March 6th. Those will be uh, the last two that we will be offering some special programming at. This month we are going to be celebrating Chinese New Year with our treats. Mm -hmm. So happy to, uh, and with our craft bags. So kind of trying to bring a little celebratory element to that. Um, moving on then through the calendar, the next event that Stephanie and I will be coordinating is of course our annual Plein Air Fest, which we have set the date for. It will be Saturday, June 18th, which is the um, Saturday of Father's Day weekend. This has been the traditional weekend. Um, and last year we had I think, 654 people that got clicked in. Uh, to join us. So we're looking forward to having an increased number of artists rejoining us this year. Uh, we'll have live music and some food by palette. So put that on your back burner of calendars for Saturday, June 18th. Uh, also, our department oversees yoga on the trail. And I think there are a few people in this room that have come to join us for yoga on the trail. Steph, you want to chat a little bit about yoga on the trail? Yeah, so uh, we gather volunteer uh, yoga instructors throughout the valley. Um, they, every Thursday between 10 and 11 um, in July and August months, and uh, it's free for the public. Uh, we've had kids come. We've had, um, we've had quite a diverse group, actually, last year. I think we had up to 40, 30, I think 38, 38 was on high. Was um, kids to grandparents. Yeah, so it's, exactly. it's really a fun opportunity. Yeah, it's been fun. Mm -hmm. um, I usually participate um, <coughs> if I can, and um, we pretty much, and then when it rained, we did it in the Wapiti, so it was kind of, it was great. Um, last summer was a huge success for yoga on the trail, mm -hmm. so we're looking forward to this year. Um, the location for yoga on the trail is still yet to be determined because now we have the beautiful, yeah, the beautiful Winston polar bear, <laughs> uh, where we usually do it, so that is still to be determined. But yes, another opportunity to have you come and join us for some fun. And then, of course, the probably biggest thing that Stephanie and I oversee is Western Visions. And I'm really happy to announce that this year will be the 35th anniversary of Western Visions, and we have set the date. So the Western Visions show and sale will be on Thursday, September 15th, and then sort of talking about the dates that go around that, the exhibit itself will open uh, to the public, uh, our, our advertised date will be Saturday, September 10th. However, we are looking at a soft opening uh, for the items in the King Gallery, which I'll get to in just a moment, uh, around the 27th of August. So uh, hopefully some uh, time 
before the full exhibit opens to enjoy a couple of the other pieces. Uh, we will be having the artist reunion reception again this year. That will be uh, the night prior on Wednesday, August, excuse me, Wednesday, September 14th. And we've had a lot of really great feedback from artists who are just eager to get back to us um, after being away because of, of COVID and travel complications for a couple of years. So looking forward to uh, doing that. And then the exhibit will remain in the galleries through Sunday, October 2nd this year. A uh, couple of things that are new this year, the biggest one is that in honor of the 35th anniversary, we will be doing our first ever live auction. As a component of this year's Western Visions, we are aiming for 35 pieces uh, in honor of our 35th. This isn't replacing the traditional intent to purchase format that we've always had. That will still be in place. It will look very much like it did last year, same kind of quantity and whatnot. Um, but we have hand invited uh, 35 artists uh, to join us. As of today, I have 30 acceptances for that, and I have 140 acceptances already for the intent to purchase format. So some of our favorite artists will be joining us, um, and we're really excited about that. This is an opportunity for us to do something special to earmark our 35th. Um, we will also be having an after-party dessert celebration to honor our 35th um, on the evening of the 14th. So I just wanted to give a little bit of what is happening in our world. Stephanie and I sit in the offices just past the bathrooms as we're heading down the hallway. So we always love it when you stop in to say hello to us. And um, I think that was all I wanted to share, unless there are any questions that I can answer for you. Just what date is the auction? The auction is Thursday, September 15th. It will be an in-person auction uh, here at the museum, as well as being available online. So, just a calendar question. Um, do we know a date for old bills from them? You is know, I, I, I don't, but I can get that information and get it to Rachel. Our marketing team actually takes care of that, yeah. not, not us. So um, it's a great question, and I'll, yeah. I'll find yeah. out. And I haven't seen any emails about that yet. Yeah. So I don't know that happening. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Usually I am about that. Right, and I think what, is it, what their tagline is something like, always the second Sunday in yeah. September. Second Saturday. 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 Second Saturday, Saturday in September. September. I'm wondering about yeah. September 10th. So... Um, yeah, Nancy. Yeah. Um, if the airport is still closed on June uh, 18th, do you mm -hmm. see that as affecting the plan area? You know, I don't. For the summertime, the majority of our traffic uh, that comes and is, mm -hmm. is family oriented and takes advantage of this event um, is normally drive in traffic. Mm -hmm. So we know that people are still coming to our area through Idaho Falls or Pocatello or Bozeman. Um, but the majority of what we see here is usually drive-in traffic, so I'm not I'm not too concerned about that. Yeah. Any other questions we can answer for you? Wonderful. Well, I will be there on Friday the 28th for cross country skiing. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing you out on the trails. Yeah. So, right, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Okay. Up next is Julia with a couple of updates from education. Hopefully you've all met Julia by now. This is Julia Spencer. I don't know that I have met everybody in the room, but um, <laughs> if you haven't, I'm Julia Spencer. I'm the Assistant Curator of Education, and I started in October, so I've been here for a couple months. Um, and I'm loving it so far, and I'm in charge of K-12 education and some adult education programs as well. Um, so a couple quick updates. Um, the first is about our Women Artists App Tour. Um, we haven't forgotten about that. We know it's been in development for a long time. And thank you to those of you who lent us your voices for that app. Um, I had the pleasure of being some of you while speaking Spanish. So we're also doing that. It will be bilingual. Um, and we'll release that app with the opening of the Bonner and Beyond exhibit. So on June 4th, that'll be released um, in accordance with that. So anything else, Rachel? That was exciting. Okay. Yeah, no, I think that's great. We're ready to see it. Oh, one more thing was that we were we're still kind of thinking about a title for that app. So if anybody has any input on the title, send them our way. <laughs> um, we can have a conversation about what we've kind of already been brainstorming, but we're looking for ideas there. Still a work in progress. Mm -hmm. um, but again, thank you to all of you who gave us your voices for that app. We're much appreciated. Um, the next update. So recently, um, 
seven staff members from the museum convened the first diversity, equity, access, and inclusion working group meeting. And I just wanted to give you a little sort of background and information about what that group is for and what we're doing. Um, so Steve approached Jane, Jane Levino and I about starting this group. Um, and we had our first meeting last week or two weeks ago? Two weeks ago. Two weeks ago. Two weeks ago. There's a few members in this group. Um, and again, seven staff members, and really our purpose is to figure out as a museum how we want to move forward into the future, um, thinking about sustainability, access, equity, and how as an institution um, we can really be a part of and represent our community, um, and that's our whole community. And so that's really our goal. We, um, last week, very much was just sort of introductory, talking about our personal reasons for being there, figuring out how we want to work together, and next week really is more about figuring out our scope of work. But the ultimate goal of that working group is to essentially come up with almost a strategic plan for how we move forward as a museum community um, with diversity, equity, access, and inclusion sort of central to our mission and to our sustainability as an institution. Um, so pretty broad right now, but we'll have regular updates and um, look for trainings, um, professional development, things like that coming in the future. And I did put a resource on each table from the um, American Association of Museums. They are very much also centering diversity, equity, access, and inclusion in their mission and goals. Um, and so they have some great resources and foundations that we're looking to use for guidance um, in terms of how we do this, um, how we do it well, sort of um, collaboratively and collectively building everyone's capacity to work in this area. So, Take a look at that if you get a chance. I can also have Rachel send it out um, after the meeting so that everybody has access to it. How often does the group meet? Uh, we meet once a month, so for an hour and a half. And the idea is to meet once a month for six months. Um, and hopefully by the end of that time period, we will have, like I said, that sort of strategic plan moving forward. Great. Thanks. And feel free to ask me questions. Um, I sit right behind Rachel on the other side of that wall. <laughs> about gallery guides um, because we've talked about gallery guiding a little bit. It comes up in conversation occasionally, but we've never really done a formal training of what a gallery guide is, what the role is, what the expectations are, things like that. Um, so I will spend a little bit of time talking about that. I had a nice meeting with our volunteer leadership committee and we talked about some of the points that I'll share with you today. So I got a lot of really good input from that group. So I very much appreciate that. Um, I made this in PowerPoint, but I don't have PowerPoint on this computer, so it's Google Slides. Hopefully, <coughs> formatting is not all screwy. OK, so gallery guides. are just one way of interacting with the public and helping give the public a little bit more engagement is really what it is. Um, the longer we're here for sort of a job description, um, guides support the mission of the museum, which is in parentheses there to refresh our memory, to impart knowledge and inspire appreciation of humanity's relationship with wildlife and nature through art and education, by welcoming and engaging with visitors, and by functioning as a resource and a guide. Um, so the goal is to try to facilitate personal discoveries about art, um, to encourage dialogue aimed at enhancing the museum experience for all visitors. So it's really about making visitors feel welcome and have a sort of a human experience while they're here, instead of just being in an empty building. So the role of the gallery guide, uh, of course volunteers represent the museum in a professional manner as an ambassador of the organization. Where your name badge is a big one. Um, there is a lot of flexibility in this role. And I think that's where maybe some of the question has come into play over the years of, well, oh, I don't know what a gallery guide is because I don't know what the expectations are. Um, there's flexibility. So if you want to sit down in the galleries, you can sit. If you want to stand up and be stationed in a place, you can station yourself. If you want to wander through the galleries, there's no script here. There's nothing really that you have to say or that you have to do. It's really open. Um, 
full dosing training, of course, is not a requirement to be a gallery guide. If you're already a docent, you'll probably find this a little easier, um, but really anyone who's a volunteer can do this. So um, what to talk about? Volunteers can share their own knowledge of the collection. Um, you guys are all really knowledgeable about the art here, certainly more than, than most people who walk through the door. They're pretty easy to impress, I think, for the most part. Um, you can talk about a particular artist if there's one that you know more about or that you like to talk about, or an artistic style if you like that, or if you're an animal person and you care about biology or you have a certain knowledge about a specific animal, you can share that type of information. Um, it's always nice to maybe share a local conservation story, tell people about the elk refuge, um, or an issue if there is one that pertains to an exhibit, like people might have questions about grizzly human interaction with the bear exhibit, or they might have a, they might want to know more about, you know, big sh bighorn sheep, or there's all kinds of issues that come up in wildlife. And if you like to talk about those kinds of kinds of things, you you can. Um, with VLC, we kind of talked about some some questions um, that we hear from guests, so I'll talk about that too, but. Also, for you as a gallery guide, you can ask, volunteer, ask them visitors questions. Um, have you been to this museum before, I think, is a good one, because they might already have had an experience here to play off of. Um, maybe it's their first time here. Uh, have you seen any animals on this trip is kind of a nice way to start a conversation. Or are there any you hope to see before you leave? Maybe they really always wanted to see a moose and they didn't get to see one, so you can show them some moose paintings or some moose sculptures. Um, the same kind of line, what's your favorite animal in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem, right? Maybe they want to see some paintings of their favorite animal. Maybe they love pikas, maybe you can go find one, that kind of thing. Um, maybe they'd like to know more about what the greater Yellowstone ecosystem is. You can always leave them in here. We have these amazing scopes. Um, right now they're pointed on a carcass, so we've seen some wolves <laughs> and lots of ravens and eagles and coyotes this morning. Um, Mark, the security guard, likes to bring people in here and show them the scopes. I, I find him doing that a lot. Um, even just asking where visitors are from, how they learned about the museum, is a welcoming way to engage with them. A few other good conversation starters. Um, what's your favorite or least favorite or most puzzling work in this gallery and why? Or is there one piece that stands out to you the most in this room? Or uh, which piece here do you wish was hanging on your old home? Kind of a buy, burn, steal question, right? Which painting would you, would you burn, which would you buy, uh, and which would you like to steal? Um, you could challenge people to spend two full minutes in front of one piece. There have been lots of studies done, and I know you guys have heard me say this before, but about how short of a time people spend with one painting. So if they look at one and go, ew, I don't like that, Sometimes you can be like, hey, sit with it for two full minutes and just see how it makes you feel and be kind of be present with that and, and talk about it, about how, maybe how your feelings changed after those two minutes or digging into it a little bit more deeply. So I guess my question for, for you guys, um, can you think of a time that you visited a museum? Um, what kinds of positive engagement have you experienced as a guest? Or maybe what questions do you wish had been asked? Or do we have people in this room who are like, I don't want to talk to people when I go to a museum because that's possible, <laughs> right? So I'm curious to hear if you guys have any perspective on the past experience. They're all museum goers, right? They've been to a museum. <laughs> I think it's different if you have kids, people with kids. Mm -hmm. Because my kids used to be like, well, you just stay away from those people. You know, because they didn't want to, get, you know, the cart people, the engagement kind of thing. So I think it varies um, on the approach, the, the unit, whatever unit of people you have. And here you got to make a, a difference with the stickers, their members versus right. the tags. And mm -hmm. so you, it, to me, it's like riding the subway. You have to do all this nonverbal assessment before you even. Right. Are people comfortable with that kind of nonverbal? Assessment, or is that something that turns a lot of people off to gallery guiding? Is that a hindrance, I guess, to volunteers, do you think? Possibly. But I think that's really good to look for that, because there is going to be a difference between mm -hmm. somebody who's a member yep. and somebody who's a, a visitor, and mm -hmm. quite likely a first-time visitor. Yeah. 
Right. And, and you can just avoid all that unnecessary conversation mm -hmm. and maybe get to a real. Right. Or not. Right. Um, a few sort of visitor frequently asked questions. Um, where are the restrooms, right? It's a big one. Uh, where should we eat lunch? Are there any good art galleries in town to visit? Um, what time do you close? Things like that. About our hours of operation. <laughs> Is admission free on Sunday? You're giggling because you see, should we do that sleigh ride thing? Um, when I've heard that from people quite a bit, you know, especially this time of year when they're looking out this window. Where are they? The sleigh ride? Should we do that? Is that fun? Um, where do we get tickets? You've probably heard some of the people who have been here ages. Um, a long time ago, many years ago, we used to sell the tickets at the front desk, and. We have not done that in close to 20 years, I don't think, but we still get people who come to the front desk and want to buy stay right tickets. Um, so it's good to know that they can't buy them here. Uh, questions about the building, I think, are pretty common. What's the, what kind of rock is this? I've heard people say, um, when did the museum open? Things like that. Maybe, you know, telling them the architect, if you can remember their name, I always forget. I remember some of the letters, Fortress or something. Yes. I, I forget. <laughs> um, but the, the castle inspiration is cool. Um, what other, are there any other questions that you guys often hear from, from visitors that I may have missed? This is just a short list. But anything I've missed completely? Wasn't there a time, I remember um, Maggie mentioning this, when some visitors would ask, where's the taxidermy? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's they a common, still do. common question. They still yeah. Do. Okay. Yeah. So you can send them to the gun barrel. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's 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 so that taxidermy end up at the gun barrel from the yeah. yeah. still yeah. the story is. It used um, to be in the museum, and yeah. they got all the taxidermy. Right, so they, they have the taxidermy over there at the gun barrel, so you can send them there for lunch and to see taxidermy. <laughs> <laughs> Um, or maybe dinner, not lunch, but um, yeah, the uh, visitor center too has, has some, so that's kind of cool. So some things that a gallery guy should know, obviously, just same as being a docent, it's okay to not know something. It's okay to tell the guest, you know what, I don't, I don't know, but we can try and find out for you. Um, but standard information, the museum hours, days of operation, pallet info, Membership, if you're comfortable talking to them a little bit about membership levels um, or just have the ability to hand them a membership form, I think that's a great bonus. Um, knowing a little bit about the kids program, especially if you happen to be here on a, on a Friday, um, is a good thing to know. Or if there's a family that you know might be local or, um, you know, you could decide if you want to bring up something like bagels. Um, the locals free day for Sundays. For an exhibit timelines, upcoming exhibits to look forward to, like the Moran this summer, things like that, that's fun to drop. Um, you can make sure they know about the Sculpture Trail, the Gary Alston Botanical Tour. Um, people have stopped me and asked me where to recycle their little admission tags. Um, also, how to, how to give a donation. They might ask you that in the, the donation box right there by where you um, donate the tags. It's great. Um, and then how to become a volunteer. I mean, that's always great, right? To, share with people. Any other info that you have shared with guests in the past that you'd like to share? They often ask if they can give you a little something after you give them a tour. And you right. Obviously don't accept it and tell them to put it in the, the box out in the mm -hmm. lobby and that would be greatly appreciated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's perfect. Yep. Okay, so some gallery safety reminders. Gallery guides can also serve as an extra eye for security. Um, but I do not consider this a policing role. That's not your number one job as a gallery guide. I'm not going to ask people to, to have those kinds of encounters with guests if they're uncomfortable with that. Um, but it is helpful to just have an extra eye for security. If you see someone who's getting too close to an artwork or you just see someone with a water bottle, um, you're just one more eye and you can either tell, tell security directly, you can go to the front desk and tell them to call security. Or if somebody really gives you, gives you, you know, a hard time about their water bottle, then obviously you can leave and <laughs> take care of that in another way. Um, so you'll hear people say, it's just water, why can't I carry it in here? And um, you guys as volunteers all know that water is damaging to paintings. And sometimes the guest just doesn't know that, they think water is fine. 
Um, so just being knowledgeable and being able to say, well, you know, it is just water, but water really can be damaging. Um, same thing with like the oils in their skin is why we don't touch it. Um, so there's just some notes about that. People tend to forget about their backpacks and then they bump into the art. People usually loosen up about backpacks if you say, we don't want you to have to buy any artwork today because you're going to bump it inadvertently with your backpack. And then they go, oh, yeah, I don't want to buy anything today. Thanks. <laughs> um, yeah, or you can alert the front desk. So we can talk a little bit more about visitor interaction. Um, some tips. Lori pointed out to um, look for those uh, member stickers. Um, one way of engaging with them is just to say, hey, I see you're a member, thanks for your membership, right? That's a, that's a way of engagement um, in itself. And um, sort of those nonverbal cues, right? You can start by just making eye contact with somebody as they walk in the room. You can smile at them through your mask. <laughs> um, smile with your eyes. Um, and see if they respond to that or kind of read their body language and if they are really just like, you can usually tell if somebody's not interested in talking to you, I think. Um, but you can say hello, you can just say, my name is Rachel, I'm a volunteer. Um, I'm here to answer questions if you happen to have any. You don't have to follow them around. You can say, I'm, I'll be in this room, right, <laughs> if you have a question. Um, and just accept that not all guests will want to interact with you. Uh, they may want to be alone, that's fine. Um, you can also just point out quick things, like you don't have to take them on a full 45 minute tour, but you can, if they're standing in front of five doll sheep, you can say, where's the, hey, where's the fifth sheep? Did you find it? That's just a quick, it doesn't involve much of a conversation. And again, they can just be like, I don't know, I don't care, like, leave me alone. <laughs> be fine with that, and just be like, oh, whatever, moving on, <laughs> right? Um, you can offer to tell them more about a painting if there's one that you really like to talk about, um, or an artist if they seem really interested in them. You can talk about your personal favorites. If they're looking at a piece that's your favorite, you can just as you're walking by, whatever, that's my favorite piece in this whole place, you know, just little conversations. Um, if you feel comfortable, you can try leading them in a slow-looking challenge or other visual thinking strategies, kind of like a see, think, wonder, which we've talked about a little bit, something like that, um, if you enjoy doing that kind of thing. So this is a reference that Lisa Fleischman um, sent to me, which seems like a great book. We don't have it in our library, and neither does the public library, um, but I could probably purchase this if people are more interested to, to read this. Um, the Museum Experience Revisited, and it paints a thorough picture of why people go to museums, what they do there, how they learn, and what museum practitioners can do to enhance these experiences. So we have a couple of sort of excerpts from this book that I thought was really good. Um, so for most people, the museum experience is a leisure activity um, designed to meet specific identity-related leisure time needs. And it has been suggested that all of those reasons, those identity-related reasons, fall under seven common categories. So the first is explorers, who are curiosity-driven visitors with a generic interest in the contents of the museum. They expect to find something that will grab their attention and fuel their curiosity and learning. Facilitators are socially motivated visitors that want to enable the learning and experience of other people in their group. Professionals, hobbyists, visitors who feel a close tie between the museum contents and their own professional or hobbyist passions. Their visits are typically motivated by a desire to satisfy a specific content-related objective. It would be like Tammy going to Washington, D.C. Right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> there for a very specific reason. Um, experience seekers, motivated to visit because they perceive the museum as a must-see destination. Um, they want to say that they've been there and done that. Rechargers are visitors who primarily seek a contemplative, spiritual, or restorative experience. That might be one of the people who doesn't want to interact with the volunteer <laughs> while they're there, I don't know. Um, they see the museum as a refuge from the workaday world or as a confirmation of their religious spiritual beliefs. Respectful pilgrims are visitors who visit museums out of a sense of duty or obligation to honor the memory of those represented by an institution or memorial. And finally, affinity seekers are visitors motivated to visit a particular museum or exhibition because it speaks to their sense of heritage and or big I identity or personhood. Mm -hmm. 
do you relate to any of these yourself? Or which categories of visitor have you encountered in our museum? Well, right